Hello, good people of Earth, and welcome to the PWBA podcast right here on Bowl TV. My name is Emil Williams Jr., and by now you know co-host of this thing is Aaron A. A. Ron Smith. And as always, Aaron, it's a it's a brand new week, of course. I got to start with how are you, my friend? Doing well. You know, the last dance came on last night, so that was uh, something I think we've both been looking forward to. So nice to get that little uh, little dose of MJ and the 98 Bulls in the, into our lives. So uh, looking forward to next week already. And then we got some Rodman. We got some Pistons years coming up. So, uh, yeah, all's good. I, I agree. Uh, is this episode seven? Episode seven sense. for us, yes. Okay. Episode seven of the PWBA podcast. And speaking of the last dance, of course, uh, our, our guest today uh, is a big fan of uh, one of those individuals who is a key uh, a figure in the Bulls dynasty runs. We're talking to the PWBA director of operations and Scotty Pippen's biggest fan, Tanil Milligan. Tanil, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys? <laughs> I'm, I'm good. We're hanging in there, well. of course. We're hanging in there, and uh, we certainly hope you are doing the same. Uh, obviously, you know, within uh, our guests, and we all know kind of where we are in regards to our homes and the situation. Um, so we'll kind of start with that because I feel like your home can always be a fun time, uh, especially with uh, your husband, Jason, and your daughter, Abby. So what's been uh, the favorite quarantine activities when you're not working so far? Oh, goodness. We have been just busy, busy, busy. Um, we need a vacation from the quarantine. Uh, we, <laughs> we decided to tackle our garage. So okay. our garage is, can now get two vehicles in. So it was a good time to tackle that. Uh, I've actually been doing a lot of puzzles. Uh, found out that I really enjoy just putting together pieces of very difficult puzzles during these times. It helps my brain just kind of you know, not think about everything that's going on. And, you know, Abigail being 10 years old, uh, she doesn't like puzzles. <laughs> <So> <laughs> um, she enjoys playing ponies, but we've enjoyed our family time. And uh, yeah, it's just been, it's been very interesting of being all together in one place without being able to escape each other. <laughs> I know it's an odd feeling. I I'd, I'd have to imagine simply because of your normal work day. Obviously, Abby would be in school. Um, so, you know, obviously, I assume they've made it fun at home. And when do you want Jason to go back to work? And when do you want Abby to go back to school? Well, I would like to hit the road as soon as possible. <laughs> they, <I agree. laughs> they do a great job of keeping down, you know, the home front here. Um, but, yeah, I, I would I would like Abigail to be able to go back to school to see her friends um, so she can experience everything that a 10 year old should experience at this time. Um, but she's a smart cookie and she's been very brave through all of this COVID-19. We've explained to her, you know, we don't hide anything, but uh, we try to explain to her how, you know, this is impacting the world and not just individuals. Just It's not just impacting her, but everyone around the world. And we kind of keep her up to date on that. As far as Jason, um, yeah, I can't wait for him to get back to testing. <laughs> <laughs> Jay Mill, my man. <laughs> now, uh, obviously, this week would have been, I uh, you know, talk about kind of kind of transitioning to things. We would have been uh, preparing for that first stop of the PWBA Tour season in Tucson in just a couple of days. We would have been leaving for that if, uh, if we weren't in our current uh, pandemic situation. So uh, since we're not going to get the opportunity to be there this week, can you tell us a little th few cool things about Lucky Strike Lanes that, uh, you know, just – from your from your visits yes uh we were excited to get back to tucson you know we would have been leaving on wednesday get there get set up and for the kickoff of the season which is always a very fun um, but high stressful time making sure that everything arrives to the bowling center uh, tucson was a fabulous city for us last year and sadly golden pin lanes had closed we were their last official event last in 2019, but um, Lucky Strike Lane stepped up to the plate and to host the event, it was going to be tremendous. They were doing everything that they possibly could, just like our other hosts, to put on a great show and show off their bowling center. Their fans were excited. We were getting lots of phone calls for the Bowl with the Pro event, but we'll, we'll get there again. It's just a little bit longer. 
Uh, but Tucson was always a great supportive city for uh, PWBA and bowling in general. So we will we will miss them this week, and I'm sure they'll be missing us. Uh, but you know we'll we'll get back again, and we were going to have a regional uh, as part of our our stop there for the first week. Um, so that was a little bit you know sad at the same time that you know we won't be there starting our typical season but I am optimistic that we will return again. And it was cool. Obviously the, the regional program really came back in full last year and was going to expand even more in 2020. Uh, we did get a few events in the books prior to uh, kind of everything shutting down. So, uh, you know, what were the early reports uh, just from the field, from the events you were at and uh, you know, just from the players uh, just how are they uh, kind of gravitating towards the regional events in the early part of 2020? They were ex super excited for PWBA regionals to come back again. You know, we were starting a whole full season, more improving, getting better at what it was already, you know, introduced it in 19 that we were coming back, giving something for uh, the up and comers that weren't quite ready to go all in, you know, jump into that, as I would always call it, jump into that ocean with those sharks. You know, our, our ladies are, are fierce, but the regional program gave a new wave of ladies who weren't um, so sure where they stood. And so they would come in, they would bowl eight games, very casual yet still enforcing all PWA rules so they could see how they enjoyed it. If it was something that they would be interested in doing later. And after surveys and talking to them during the event, they were ready to sign up when we came back. We've had quite a few ask about the regional program. So um, for that group, they, they were just tremendous. They were awesome ambassadors. And I look forward to having them not just bowling the regionals, but back to the national tour when we return. And uh, speaking of the tour, the national tour, and you, you referenced your optimism. If you can just give us a, just kind of a brief update on uh, on the PWA tour and kind of where we stand uh, at the moment. Well, at the moment, we're postponed indefinitely. We are doing everything we possibly can to look at our calendars to see, you know, where we could have a, a tour, what it's going to look like as soon as they lift all the restrictions and what we're, you know, what we could possibly do. So there's 120 million different scenarios that we have put on paper. So as soon as something happens, we will be able to flip the switch and get back on the road. Uh, again, working with our partners, working with our host, you know, seeing how their cities and their states are being governed when this light, you know, when they get the green light. Uh, you know, but we are working with our partners and with our executives to make sure that there will be something for the ladies to bowl. Now, of course, Aaron and I see you uh, not only at the workplace, but certainly on the road. And we know uh, how important you take your role. So I know this has been just as difficult on, you know, certainly everyone else. So uh, I'll ask what's been the most difficult part of this situation as as the director of operations, as the tournament uh, director. Oh, well, a lot of the hard part for me is not having, you know, a glimpse into the future of when we will be on the lanes. You know, a lot of businesses, we don't know exactly when, and I don't like surprises. So this is very, very tough for me right. um, to not know when, don't have a whole lot of, you know, precise answers, you know, without, I don't want to make something up and just throw things in the air. So it's, that's the tough part for me um, as a tournament director, not being able to see the athletes um, on the lanes, not being able to see our fans. Um, and again, you know, I've enjoyed my time at home. I've had a lot of time at home this season, but I'm ready to hop back on the road. So difficulty not being, you know, in the workplace and having a show um, to put on. 
I know I haven't received uh, one one text from you. Well, that's not true. You we've sent multiple texts just checking in. But this week would be like you know when's your flight coming? Right. Just double checking. Hey, you got a car? You know those those kind of things. And uh, so and and all of us really making sure that you know whoever is going to be at the event, we're all good. We know when we're all getting in, et cetera. And we, and we won't have that uh, this week. And you know hopefully it won't be that long. But uh, I'm already kind of missing that part too. Oh, believe me, I can send you a text to see, you know, <laughs> where you're going tomorrow. Make sure you stay home. Um, I've been using a hashtag on social media that says, you know, please stay home so my girls can bowl. Um, it's a great hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, stay home so my girls can bowl. That's a big thing. Um, stay home so you can come bowl, bowl with the pros. Stay home so I can um, text Emil and Aaron and everybody so I know when they're getting in. Uh, you know, car rentals, but I'll, I'll check in with you this week to see, you know, where you're at and what you're I doing. I would appreciate It'll it. All good. No problem. I, I will want it to that. feel as normal as possible. <laughs> <laughs> my, my travel anxiety is, is not with me. And that's, what's really weird about this situation is normally about this time. Um, very high, strong of where are we, what are we doing? It's I'm almost pestering, you know, what's happening, but I would just want to make sure everybody um, is taken care of. Um, as well as making sure the athletes, I did check in with them last week um, on our private uh, page, you know, just making sure that they knew I was thinking about them. You know, I think about them every day and I'm sure they think about when they're going to bowl their next bowl mm -hmm. with the pro event. What's mm -hmm. the uh, toughest call you think you've had to make thus far as a, as a tournament director? Oh, what we're going to have for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> That can be tough, actually. It can be tough because sometimes we don't eat. <laughs> yeah, don't tell my wife that. I I know, I know. Um, there's been a lot of tough calls. A lot of, um, you know, following the rules is not hard. The rules are the rules. They're black and white. This is what we follow and we have to do it. Um, sometimes when somebody breaks a rule, you know, whether, I don't think anyone breaks them intentionally. Most of them are you know, unintentional, didn't know, didn't pay attention. Oh my gosh. And it's having to go and um, talk to the athletes. Um, you know, if you have to disqualify somebody, that's always tough. Um, you know, you try your best not to, not to cry in front of them. <laughs> um, you know, many tears are shed uh, behind the doors for them because you feel, you know, you feel bad because they prepare for it. So, of course, you know, having to disqualify anybody um, for something that unintentionally, you know, that's always that's always a tough call. Uh, one of the toughest tournament director uh, situations, I believe it was two years ago now. Yeah. When we were in Richmond for the tour championship and the ceiling was leaking, um, you know, essentially the sky was falling. At that time, that was an interesting, interesting experience. <laughs> a tornado was about three miles from where we were at. Um, you know, just so as a tournament director, trying to stay calm and making sure, hey, we're good, everything's fine. I'll come back out on the microphone, letting them know, hey, this is the situation we're in, um, and just trying to stay calm. It's that old analogy about being a duck on water where the ducks look like they're so smooth on top of the water, but their little feet are paddling underneath. Um, I just want to look smooth on top of the water, even though underneath sometimes I'm trying to dig in and it's a, a little crazy, but Richmond, that one was, uh, that was tough. Uh, so if anybody sees me panicking, then you should panic. But if we're not panicking, we're good. So Richmond was a, interesting situation uh some of the athletes didn't couldn't get from their hotel to the venue um in time so we had to delay matches it was um it was a crazy four days of bowling <laughs> it was I, b I believe that was the closest i personally have been to a, to a live tornado like in the vicinity i've been places where you hear the the sirens or the alarms but imminent danger was not the case at that time but obviously richmond was literally like you know there were of course the 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 very in uh, inquisitive storm chasers that were 
on, on the premises as well, kind of taking a look and looking at the radar. And it was definitely a serious situation. And you handle it well, absolutely. <laughs> Well, thank you. You know, when security tells you to stay in the building, I'm going to listen to security. Yes. Yes. Um, so from the from the tour perspective, and obviously you've got uh, both point of views at that point um, and have been through some difficult times on tour when the tour did fold in 2003. Uh, what was it like when you first heard that? I guess a, it was a possibility, but then obviously, you know, when it actually went down. Well, the few weeks before tour actually ended, our last event in 2003, um, John Summer had spoken to a group, the group and had said, hey, we got a couple more weeks left under our belt. Uh, WIBC at the time came through, helped us out, um, you know, just thinking about, oh, this isn't going to happen. And they're they're going to save us. We're going to be good. We're going to be on the road. And then we get to um, Dallas, Texas, and they said, this is it. This was our last week. And I said, okay, until next year. <laughs> right. You know, and, and, you know, crickets, you know, they wanted to, they tried, they tried, you know, everybody, nobody wants to ever see something completely shut down, especially in this, any sports. Um, but when they told us that, you know, it was just, I, I think it was in a daze. It was in a cloud. It was, it was weird. I loaded up the tour mobile. That's what I called my vehicle when I was out on the road. I had a Ford Aerostar. Yes. Took out the All back right. seats and it was fully loaded. Yep. Had lots of bowling balls back there, but loaded up the, the tour mobile and left Dallas, Texas and headed back for Southern California and just drove all the way and just didn't know what what to do. I thought it was just temporary. Had only been out on tour. I joined the tour in 2000, in the year 2000. So both 2000, 2001, um, two, and then what, five events, four events in 2003. And that was it. I'm like, oh, this can't okay, they're just going through a hard time and never came back till 2015. I mean, so, you know, a lot of time in between there, but it was extremely sad, extremely sad time in my life. And um, yeah, because that's all I wanted to do is I wanted to bowl, I wanted to get in that tour mobile and travel the country and, and, um, and compete. And it was never about the money. It was, I mean, the, yes, the money's nice when you when you get it, and Uncle Sam enjoys it as well. Um, <laughs> but it was never about that. It was about competing. It was about winning. It was about you know even about losing. Um, but yeah, 2003, that day in in, in June was extremely the saddest time in my life. And you had won, I believe, a stop or two before that, right, in Memphis? Uh, the, yeah, the, the week before. The week before our very last stop, Golden Memphis, Tex or excuse me, Memphis, Tennessee. And, yeah, and that was, that was a fun show. It was the lefty killer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've, heard a, I've heard a story or two maybe about this. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, top five and only one only. One writing on the show, never experienced anything like that. And it was really fun. <laughs> and I say that in all good, you know, spirits, both my parents are left-handed. So how about that? <laughs> how about so that? yes, in, in Memphis. Um, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, that's sitting right outside my doors here. My Memphis trophy. That will be um, one to remember. For sure. Now, uh, as you mentioned, you're only, you know, a few years into your professional bowling career when it went away. But uh, in, in that short time, uh, share with us some of your favorite touring stories. You know, obviously, Bowl TV appropriate, of course, but. Uh, and I can't share. <laughs> I was going to say, it might be tough. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, what was it like, you know, going out there, you know, 20, 30, you know, weeks a year traveling 
the country and, and, uh, and lacing up in bowling. Yeah, it was, um, it was, it was scary the first time, you know, I, I was very fortunate. I came from an area where I had a lot of, um, really good people around me who had been part of professional tours, whether it be PBA or PWBA, LPBT, who, um, who really took me under their wing. So I was a fortunate one that I had some really good guidance. Uh, but my first year on tour, you know, bought a, the tour mobile, as you like to call it, uh, hadn't, hadn't driven it long distance, had no idea if it was going to work. And I had a, um, a roommate that was coming over from Australia. We had never met uh, Carol Giannotti, who I had looked up to for many years. You know, she be, lived in Southern California for a while. And um, she had a friend from Australia coming over and she said, hey, Tennille, hey, T, that's going to be your roommate. You guys would be roommates. So I said, OK, whatever. You know, we traveled and and Maxine Nabel um, had so much fun with Maxine those first couple of years. Uh, her driving 100 miles per hour while I was pretending to sleep. That's always a fun story. One eye open, um, you know, driving down the wrong way of a one-way street. Those were always fun. Um, <laughs> I like to drive at night. Um, so Maxine drove during the day. Uh, just experiencing different parts of, of the country and um, different cities. Uh, and seeing different fans and not knowing, you know, do I do this? Do I do that? And, and of course the, um, the veterans would be like, don't do that. Yes. Do this. You should do this. I would advise you to do this and definitely don't do that. <laughs> um, but a lot of stories, the, the ladies were great. One big family out there. There were, there were hugs, there were kisses, there were fights. Uh, you know, like sisters do. But I will say that if somebody was in trouble, there was always somebody there that would pick you up. And sometimes it was the person that you didn't, you would never have thought would have helped you. And they were usually the first ones to. How about that? And that, that camaraderie is still something we see out there on a, on a weekly basis. And so it, it's cool to see that it has continued in that fashion. It does. It, it does continue. And, you know, and I hope it continues. Just remember where you where you started and when the new when the new girl comes in and even if she's had experience, she really hasn't had that experience yet. So try to make it as comfortable as possible. Doesn't mean that, you know, you have to give away all your secrets. But um, those little those little travel, those travel tips, those go a long way. You know, don't drive 100 miles an hour over a bridge with 30 bowling balls in the back and hit a speed bump. I mean, just don't do that. I'm, I'm curious what, uh, what some of the similarities that you perhaps may see as the, as a, you know, the tour director, but obviously looking from afar, so to speak, uh, or, you know, really looking up close in, in that regard and some of the similarities perhaps that, uh, you know, bases on, uh, when you were a player, do you see anything? Do you see some of the same tendencies or, you know, we talked about players helping one another. That would be one. But anything else you see? Well, I do. I, I do see them helping one another. Um, you know, one thing that I notice that's different now, and I think it's just because of the timing that our tour um, in which it takes place. You know, you come in on a Thursday, you leave on a Sunday morning. It's not... Um, very many days where we were a lot of days at the time, you know, you go into a city on a Sunday, you bowl, bowl with the pro, you have your practice session, Monday, Tuesday, qualifying, Wednesday, you would have, you know, match play Wednesday, and then Thursday nights would be shows, uh, get in a car, leave on a Friday, drive 600, 800 miles, wherever it was that we were going and then start it all over again. Where this group, um, you know, it's very shortened. So one thing I notice is that they don't stick around as long as we used to um, after after match play or after show and because they need to get home. And that's, a, I mean, it's okay. It's, you know, we, we didn't have to get home. All we had to do was get in the car and, and go to the next stop. So that's a little bit different. Um, but I still see the, um, the friendships, the bonds, the helping, that's still there. 
I think that's just human nature. And, um, and what people want to do is they want to help. Uh, so in that case, our, our athletes are superstars. What about, um, which, you know, again, I think because of the differences in the, the tours, essentially, uh, I assume the preferred method of travel when you were a player was was by vehicle or car. Um, and obviously, I think today is more uh, airplane travel because of the amount of days, you know, now, as you just mentioned. Uh, what was the longest uh, or the furthest distance from from one stop to another that you recall driving? Oh, my gosh, I I'll, I do remember. <laughs> I do remember it was um, Rockford, Illinois to Las Vegas. Okay. And it was after a TV show was on a Thursday night and it was a late show. We, we were carpooling. I was with uh, Maxine and we were carpooling with Carol Giannotti and Wendy McPherson. Uh, Wendy and I both were on the show that night and we had to leave as soon as the show was over because we had to be in Las Vegas to bowl our, um, our pro-am squads on Saturday. Mm. And it's a 26 hour drive. So, I mean, do the math on that Thursday yeah. night, get in the car, <laughs> we drive all night, you know, Rockford, Illinois to Las Vegas. Um, hopefully get some rest in between and, and um, yeah, being, Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to bowl. You know, hi, my name's Tanil at Grijalva. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nice to meet you. You know, just kind of and smile and be ready to go. But uh, that's that was the adrenaline. That was the fun of it, and those rides. And um, you know, Maxine's gonna kill me, but going through a McDonald's drive-through and her trying to order a fillet of fish without tartar sauce. And she has a very strong Australian accent and she was saying no tartar. And the gentleman on the other side didn't understand what she was saying. And she is screaming, no tartar. <laughs> and oh my gosh, I was crying. It's hilarious. We finally get up there and it has tartar and she throws it out the window. And I mean, we're just, I mean, sorry, Maxine. <laughs> sorry, but so those were some of the wonderful stories that we have on there. But it, that was a long drive, um, you know. And and a few of us were happy on the drive, and some of us aren't so happy on the drives. But um, and it all depends on who's driving and the amount of time that you get there. But it took us, um, I think, less time than it was supposed to. Yeah, I was going to say, so who you and Wendy were on the show. So was it a happy, decent, uh, or just mad drive for you two? Who won? Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I had a very easy drive. <laughs> Fair enough. To Las Vegas. Sorry, when? It happens. That it does. <laughs> it, well, see, this sounds perfect. I've been hearing things about, you know, the cannonball run is kind of a new thing with no one on the roads now. So there you go. You were originating it back in 2000. But, uh, you know, obviously, um, you know, four wins on tour, uh, three of the majors. So Major Milligan, of course, uh, we got to use that moniker. Um, but, you know, kind of looking back at, at your wins, uh, was there a particular favorite one, one that really stood out to you as far as, you know, three different majors? Uh, just if you had to rank them, uh, could you do that? Oh my goodness. Um, well, the U S the U S women's open was my very first title. So I would always rank that one. Number one, um, you know, rookie kid, you know, you think you dream about it. You, you watched it at local bowling center. The U S women's open used to come into the U S open used to come into town where I lived. So I'd sit in the stands and watch and, just hear what it was, you know, what it meant. Um, and then being able to compete on that stage um, at a U.S. Women's Open. So that one would be number one for me and my very first win. Um, my second one um, would be the Queens. Queens would be ranked number two for me back in 2005. 
um, no tour um, in 2005. So we were limited to very few events. Um, so to be able to win an event, uh, a major, a, you know, they're all hard to win, but that one is a, um, a unique format. Anyone can win at any time. You could bowl 750 and lose against your opponent and 450 and win uh, in the same round, you know, right next to each other. Um, so that one was interesting. But in 2005, um, the week prior, we had lost my mother-in-law, Jason's mom, had passed away. So really con contemplated if I was even going to go bowl um, or just stay back. And, and Jason's dad was like, heck no, you're going to go bowl. <laughs> so, um, so that one was tough. So, you know, a lot of hard hardships at that time. So U S uh, U S women's open Queens, and then for uh, another major players championship. Um, that one was the one in Rockford against London. Um, and then um, Memphis, you know, I consider Memphis a major too. That was against three amazing, four, four amazing left-handers. <laughs> De facto major. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's how I would rank my wins. I know uh, the, the Southern California connection uh, in 2000 kind of was prominent. You and then Robert Smith winning uh, uh, on the men's side of things. I guess, A, kind of where are you from or within Southern California, just to kind of give the, the viewers and the listeners a sense. And then, like, you know, how close is the the Southern Bowling or Cal Bowling community, um, which I assume made that a little bit extra special, of course, with you and Robert both claiming those titles. Yeah, so I grew up in a small town of Orange, California, which is in Orange County. Uh, for most of the people uh, that would understand, if you've ever been to Disneyland, it is about, I lived about five miles from Disneyland. So that's where in Southern California where I grew up in the city of orange and i lived on lemon street <laughs> how about that <laughs> how about that um so growing up in southern california had a great youth program a great bowling community all through there uh, robert smith he lived about an hour and change north he lived in simi valley but we both grew up and um, competed in the junior amateur tour which would a lot of people understand it as JAT, J-A-T. And we know quite a few, you know, you mentioned yourself and obviously Robert, but, uh, you know, Jason Thomas, uh, who works with us at USBC as well, was a big part of that. Uh, and, and there were a ton of big names. Uh, I know Mike Devaney was out there as well. Just uh, how much did that tour and kind of having that element kind of help mold your game throughout the course of the years? I mean, that absolutely it did. Don Adamick, uh, Amory Dugan, Randy Peterson, George Branham III. <laughs> I mean, the list goes on and on and on. We had Barry Asher. There was also Mark Baker, Greater Los Angeles Junior All-Stars. That was a big travel league. Uh, Stacy, I mean, you, I could sit here all day long and keep naming names of, of individuals who bowled. Missy. Bellander, oh, I'm sorry, Parkin, <laughs> I knew her <laughs> Bellander, Missy Parkin, Scott Moore. I mean, again, just on and on and on and on. And how that molded me was the dedication, um, the volunteers that ran these organizations for, for us youth to bowl on Sundays, Saturdays and Sundays. Um, if it wasn't for them, uh, obviously we wouldn't be able to do so. But the competitive scene out there was unbelievable. We got to travel up and down California. There was a, a fun rivalry between Northern and Southern California. You know, you had SoCal and NorCal, or as sometimes we called it, NoCal. <laughs> you know, so there was it was always fun. We have State Scratch, and that was in the middle of the, of the state of California. We got to travel to Nevada, uh, Hawaii. Had, had events, the IAO Wiz Kids. We just had something to bowl all the time. There was a tournament. If you wanted to bowl, you can go to San Diego. Oh, there's nothing in Cal, you know, in California this week. Oh, going to Nevada, going to Arizona. Uh, it was just really easy and it was competitive. It was, and 
I don't think we would be able to um, be that competitive unless it was for those moms and dads that drove us everywhere. What was, uh, besides winning, of course, the in 2000, what was so unique? Give us something that was very unique um, and that you recall, obviously, vividly about, about that U.S. Women's Open. Oh, there was a lot of, a lot of different things at that U.S. Women's Open that year. It was, um, you know, the, the first one I ever bowled. You know, never bowled a U.S. Women's Open before. I qualified and got in um, to the event. They were, I remember the lanes being really hard. It was probably the hardest event I've ever bowled or ever experienced. Um, and then we bowled with the men uh, at the same time. We didn't bowl in the same pairs, but we bowled, you know, one pair would be um, male athletes, then the female, male, and then the female, and so forth and so on. And it would go... Um, like that, even with match play. Uh, so that was very unique. And, you know, I was 23 at the time and I'm a bowling nerd. I am I, in awe all the time of, of the talent. So for me to be standing there waiting for my turn and look over and go, oh my gosh, look at it, it's Pete Weber. And look at the other side and go, <laughs> oh my gosh, it is Alita Sill. And just, I mean, just, I'm such a bowling nerd and I'd be watching them bowl and go, wow, that was really good. And not, oh, Tennille, you've got to focus. <laughs> so that was really hard. Um, but, you know, going through that and, um, you know, first year on tour, on tour, uh, making it through just gosh, that, that week was a long week, a long rewarding week. I mean, forget the, the winning part of it, but, uh, a few months prior, almost a year before I lost my bowling coach and friend, Jim Lee, um, who wanted me to go out on tour, but I bowled on Team USA in 1999. He didn't understand why I'd want to do that <laughs> <laughs> um, until later, you know, he explained it and it was all good and I have a whole nother story about that. But um, he had passed away. And when I found out I made the show, I stood at the at the approach all by myself and just stared at the pins and went, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And all of a sudden I felt this blow, like, you know, like when someone walks by you and they blow mm -hmm. on the back of your neck. Well, Jim, anyone who knew Jim, he was just a little, he drove you crazy, but you loved him. And he used to do that all the time. He'd walk by and he'd like flick you or he'd just do something. And something blew on the back of my neck while I was standing there. The weirdest thing, ah, just, I mean, oh, I'm getting goosebumps. Just, you know, every time I think about that, but he, I believe in, in that whole afterlife. I believe in ghost. Um, but I knew he was there. I knew he was there at that moment. And then we went, um, the TV show was bold in an arena. It was bold at the Coliseum where the Phoenix Suns used to play. And, um, that was an experience in itself. You know, this rookie never experienced anything like that, after, even after bowling around the world. But um, to, to be there for that uh, was just really eye-opening and getting to bowl against people that I've looked up to. And, you know, my first match was against Carol Giannotti, who, again, goes back like, oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm bowling against somebody I really look up to. And at that time, you know, now she's a friend, but we're competitors. Right. And bowling against Liz Johnson. I was like, uh, okay, this I've I've seen her win this before. You know, it was it was pretty um it's pretty scary. And then even before that, you know, we have practice sessions and you're going through, you know, different feelings and the crowd's not there and and then the crowds come in and you've got the men who are born at the same time. And, you know, at least a familiar face in Robert Smith on the men's side for me, it was, he's like, all right, go get him. <laughs> uh, was, was fun. But uh, there's a really good story um, during our practice uh, before we were getting ready to go live, live television. 
And I had a phenomenal ball rep who really helped me the whole week just stay in, you know, stay in the zone, you know, focused on the bowling. And when I bowled as a competitor, I didn't want to talk too much about, you know, ball layouts and do this and that and just, okay, you know, drill me up something that a feel good grade. I'll go through it and watch my ball motion. You know, my ball was my guide. I wanted to talk about, can you get me something to eat? You know, what's for lunch? What are we going to do afterwards? You know, <laughs> kind of just to stay loose. I didn't want right. to just anything but bowl. <laughs> anything but bowl. I didn't want to talk about bowling, but um, as we're preparing, you know, drilled up some new balls and, and um, he had some very interesting words um, for a young rookie bowling for the first time on uh, for a major you know, he had told me um, that my ball reaction sucked. That was his words. Your ball reaction sucks. You're going to have to out bowl them. I mean, what would you do if somebody told you that? I'd have a, a very terrible look on my face. <laughs> Terrified, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, but who would tell somebody that? Um, only somebody who knew the person and they knew what, what would motivate me because I wasn't a sugar coater. I didn't want anybody to say, oh, you're throwing it good. You're doing a good job. Nope. I wanted the truth. I wanted you to tell me I sucked. I wanted you to tell me it was bad. So, so thanks, Chad Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> nice story. I, owe, I owe all of, I, I mean, that win truly without without his help um you know it was the best it was the best piece of advice i've ever received and i still use it to this day <laughs> certainly two great stories there uh first with jim and then with chad and you told both of those at your uh usbc hall of fame induction a couple of years ago which was uh which was great to hear and uh, we'll, we'll kind of circle around back to that, but another big reason why you're part of the USBC Hall of Fame is your excellent career on Team USA. Uh, so I believe six years on the team, a uh, couple dozen medals, uh, a few great performances at the Pan Am Games. So for you, just, uh, you know, what were some of your highlights being part of uh, Team USA and wearing the red, white, and blue? Oh, Team USA, that was, um, you know, growing up again in Southern California, you had a lot of Team USA members uh, that traveled and that they got to talk, talk to and say, Oh, where did you go? And they're like, Oh, I went to, you know, Malaysia. I went to Europe. I got to do all these things. It's like for bowling. And that was a amazing piece. So when it came around in 1999 was the very first year um, that I made the team and um, got to go to the Pan American games. And that was, that was a lot of fun. We were in um, Canada for that one. Um, and yeah, being able to have that experience and travel all the all over the world, and again, going back to the Jim Lee story uh, real quick, and, and that he didn't understand why I wanted to bowl on Team USA. He didn't understand what it meant. He he was like, "You can't buy steak with gold medals. You can't. You can't buy steak with gold medals. You need to go out on tour, make some money, buy some steak, buy me a steak dinner." Or <laughs> that was you know his motivation and. And the Pan American Games that year, I, you know, I got to go and he um, was sick with cancer. I uh, got a phone call while I was in Canada, uh, called about, um, you know, Jim wasn't doing well. Uh, this was from Stacy Ryder, his fiance at the time and, and friend of mine. And uh, I said, oh, OK. And I'll never forget. I said, well, I won the gold medal in team and now we're getting ready to bowl our, um, our next event. She's like, no. He said to come home, come home. I didn't understand. So uh, Team USA program at the time, uh, Palmer Falgren, Teresa Bear, they were with us in USOC. They were very accommodating. They um, sent me on a flight home. I didn't bowl the last event at the Pan American Games and got home and went straight to the hospital with my gold medal, gave it to Jim and he sat in the chair and he looked at it and he put it on and he said, this was cool. He goes, wow, this is really cool. This is awesome. And right then and there, I was like, oh, he doesn't hate me for not buying him a steak dinner. 
um, but that that was when it was like, okay, um, you knew it meant something that because this is a gentleman who always gave me a hard time about it. But um, so that's when it really hit how much Team USA really meant. Um, you know, went out on tour the next time, and then when um, tour folded, had to wait a few years to regain my amateur eligibility because at the time they didn't allow pros and regained the status back, got back on the team in 2007 and got to go back to the Pan American Games again that year. And it was just, it's amazing. Uh, Team USA program, getting to train, getting to work with the world's best coaches, getting to work in, in a team environment with other athletes. Uh, never really bowl. I didn't bowl collegiately, uh, bowled once or one or two events as a, as a combined collegiate team. So I never really had that team experience. Um, but I will cherish that forever. What about uh, favorite places or cities to travel while you're on tour? And then, you know, same thing from a Team USA perspective too. Oh, travel on tour. I loved when we, we went to Myrtle Beach. That is a great place. Myrtle Beach was awesome. Our hotel had a lazy river. <laughs> <laughs> a lazy river and that was uh and we had a clam bake out on the ocean that was right there that was just awesome loved myrtle beach uh for international my favorite city internationally to bowl in was barcelona barcelona it's beautiful uh it's, i felt extremely safe why I was there, never felt out of place. And my mom says it's because I look like everyone else that was there, so. <laughs> and I did get stopped on the street quite a few times and asked in Spanish if where, you know, how to get somewhere. What What's, do you uh, answer? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, what was your answer? My answer? <laughs> <laughs> what, what year did you uh, go to Barcelona? I was in Barcelona 2000. I got to go twice. I think it was seven and eight. 2007 and eight, I think, was the years I went. Yeah, that was fun. I got to bowl the European Masters while I was there. I'm but. curious if, um, you know, because, you know, uh, one of the athletes on tour, Josie Barnes, who has been on this podcast, got married in Barcelona. Did you guys ever trade stories or did she? Ask advice beforehand. I don't know if she even knew that you had been to Barcelona. <laughs> I don't think she knew I had been to Barcelona, but the simple answer to that email is no, we okay. didn't. But when I found out she was getting married there, I was, I mean, one, if somebody's getting married, but getting married abroad, I would have never thought Barcelona. And I was just like, oh my gosh, that's, that's going to be just the most perfect place. It's beautiful. And, and in some of the photos that, Josie has shared, and it is truly a magical city. Excellent. Very cool. Now, uh, you know, we, we kind of talked about the USBC Hall of Fame and the induction speech and uh, obviously the accolades to get there. But uh, when you got the call, you were actually uh, a little bit busy with work at that time. And I, I think that, you know, this was something uh, a few of us got to share with you as well, which was, was pretty cool for us. But uh, when you got the call, um, tell us a little bit about that experience. So, yes, it was in Las Vegas. We were at team trials, uh, working, working the event and, you know, watching bowling, watching, you know, who's going to be on the team next, trying to take notes, who does this well, who interacts, who has good sportsmanship, who does this, um, you know, and all of a sudden I get a phone call and it's from Frank Wilkinson. And Frank Wilkinson at the time was the USBC president. And when the USBC president is calling my phone, I was like, oh, shoot, I better answer this. <laughs> I didn't think of anything else except, oh, this is work. And if Frank is calling me, it's important. And Frank has never called me on my cell phone before. <laughs> so um, I excuse myself I'm, and I go take the call. I'm like, hey, how's it going? He's like, oh, good. How, how's team trials? And so I think and I get giving him a report of what's happening. And I said, oh, this is going well, da, 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 we're watching this. And he goes, oh, okay, cool, great. I just wanted to talk to you about some news. And I said, some news? And I knew they had some voting going on, but I, 
I, you know, I'm not expecting anything at this point. And he just said, um, I'd like to congratulate you on being in, elected to the USBC Hall of Fame. And I mean, I get emotional now because I'm such a bowling nerd, sorry. Um, when it goes about and I just said, huh? I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> say, say it again, say it again. And um, So he shared that with me and now I'm in the bathroom. Now I'm running into the women's restroom. I'm crying. And, um, you know, nobody's in the restroom at the time. And, and I just, I couldn't believe it. I, uh, you know, had a, had a nice little stint on, on tour, um, had a really good showing at the USBC events, women's championships, team USA. So thankfully, you know, all, all of that came around and, and my peers thought it was, um, was enough to, to vote me in. So it meant a lot because it wasn't just voted in by, um, you know, just a, a group of, of folks reading a resume. It was voted by other superior performance athletes um, as well as a few others. But um, that's what meant a lot was that um, somebody thought I was worthy enough to wear that cool little USBC gold patch that says Hall of Fame. Um, but yeah, so I asked Frank if I could tell anybody. He said no. <laughs> you know, don't tell anybody until the press release. And I said, well, at least my husband. And he said, yes. Yeah. So I called my husband. And of course, Jason doesn't remember anything. So it's OK. <laughs> um, so I wasn't worried about him telling anybody. Um, but it was hard not to be able to tell my dad. You know, I wanted to call and tell my dad. Um, but I knew he would tell everybody. So he would have driven to the bowling center that right then and there, <laughs> no matter what time it was and, and got on the microphone and told everybody. But um, that was um, really, really cool. And, and um, when I came out of the restroom, you know, red face, tears coming down. And I'll never forget uh, going back, Josie Barnes and, and Aaron McCarthy were standing right outside the, the restroom and they looked at me and like, are you okay? What's wrong? Are, what's wrong? And, you know, I, I mean, what am I going to tell somebody that knows I clearly have been crying? Oh, nothing. Mm -hmm. They're going to be like, no, what's wrong? And so I just told him, oh, nothing. I'm having a hot flash. <laughs> because, you know, I could. Um, so that was my excuse is having hot flashes um, at that time. And, you know, folks, you know, fellow, you know, co-workers, are you okay? And it's like, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, Brian O'Keefe sitting next to me as we're doing through it. He's like, T, what's wrong? And I said, oh, I'm just having a flash. I need some water. Um, so it was um, an interesting time to get a call and, and to be able to, you know, play off that, you know, I'm having a hot flash. Now, we were there, though. Uh, Aaron, were, weren't we sitting next to you, to Daniel at this point? Because obviously being on the communication staff, you know, we kind of got the heads up, so to speak, right? We knew what was happening. So I just remember looking down at you to see if you would make eye contact, but you didn't, I don't think. Yeah, I, I, I recall us getting the uh, getting the press release ahead of time because uh, usually they will let us know about the news just before it goes out to everyone. And all of a sudden it came across. It's like, wait, Tanil, what? What? Where? Is she going to look? Is she going to check her email? Does she know? Does she know? I did. I checked my email. I looked and, and that's when I knew it was official to the world that it was going to go out. And then I looked down and I, re I remember, you know, after a while, you know, Aaron looking down and going like this and Emil's like, you know, <laughs> as cool, you guys being as cool as possible. And as I'm like this. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'm pretty sure we were on the air. <laughs> Yeah, we were. Like, yeah, we were. <laughs> you know, and, and people coming by and hugs, and you know, at that time, I'm like, I gotta pay attention to what I'm doing here, and I, you know, I appreciate it, but I don't want people to think, oh, you know, hey, I can't talk to you right now. I've got to focus on team trials. But um, yes, tears flowing down, and and then um, yeah, no more hot flashes at that point. <laughs> Excellent on the hot flash situation. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm I'm curious. Speaking of uh, myself and Aaron, 
do you have any good stories you would like to share about us? Uh, of course, this is Bull TV appropriate. <laughs> oh my gosh, let's see. I, I mean, we spend a lot of time on the road or even in the office or, you know, pinging each other IMs and, you know, um, you know, thankfully we're all um, pretty good sports at being, you know, razzed with one another. So I appreciate that. I appreciate a good little dig once in a while, but good stories. I mean, I, I still to this day don't understand, Emil, how you have not seen a Christmas story. No, oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, <laughs> I just don't understand. And we went to the That's Christmas fair. story house. And we did. We did. I was there. I, I saw have proof. a lot of things I, I didn't know. <laughs> and you're like, oh, what's this? And I, oh. I just don't understand how you... Okay, hold on. Email, have you seen the movie yet? No. No. I can't wait to get multiple tweets and uh, comments about about the situation. Uh, I mean, people should start FaceTiming, start doing everything you can to email about a Christmas story. I just don't understand it to this day. To, you know, and still, I've seen like uh, bits and pieces. I've never watched it from, from start to finish. And, and Aaron, I mean, just the times of being with you on the road and, uh, you know, Aaron is pretty calm and cool, but oh my gosh, if something goes wrong, it's so much fun to watch Aaron explode. I truly enjoy it. And then I have to laugh at him and then he looks at me and then he's like, he's fine again. So Aaron, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, there's so many other stories that we could possibly share that off, you know, bowl TV at night. Maybe you guys should start incorporating. <laughs> Probably a good idea. <laughs> I mean, we've been trying to work in wine with a meal. But, I'm all um, for that too, and I've stepped my game up on in that area as well recently. But um, yeah, it, I mean, it's just again, it's it's a different, it's a good family, and and I'm in I'm in good hands when I'm on the road, and I feel confident that if something were to go go wrong, go astray, um, I could be somewhere and lean on you guys so so thank you uh for that oh absolutely definitely mm -hmm. right back at you on that i know i know for me um I, the the one thing that i that i'd like that you know or at least reference me with is uh i think it was my first year covering the tour and we were in lincoln and uh, i would i had to pack up you know we did the um live stream and everything and then i still had to write a story and still you know i just posted up in the in the locker room you know kind of sat indian style <laughs> and i had some really dope socks on and you just snapped a photo uh yeah. which i believe is still on social media uh, I, oh and i still have it oh good okay perfect <laughs> but yeah that's that's one i always always think back to I still have that one. I still have the one of you sleeping, uh, but I think everyone has one of, of you sleeping somewhere. I was going to say, a lot of people got some photos of me of me sleeping at... Uh, now, don't sleep on the job, ladies and gentlemen. Don't no, 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 get no. get the no, wrong no. idea. Uh, no, no, no. But we tend to work long hours. After hours, after <laughs> what hours. What we do. <laughs> That's funny. I need to ask Aaron. Aaron, have... I mean, you've got to have a good story. Yeah, I've found great stories, but... Uh, you, you, I, I think the thing that one of the things I miss the most in this current situation with, uh, you know, obviously we're all working from home. Uh, I always like just walking up to your office when I had a question and, you know, we had the ability to just, just kind of always work through problems very well together and kind of figure things out and figure out logistics or if we want to do something or if we're thinking of this. Uh, I, I've just always enjoyed that, you know, having the open door to, you know, walk over unannounced and knock a few times and just, you know, whatever it is we talk out, whether it's about the tour or, you know, some other element of USB-C, always just appreciate all those times. Uh, so so those definitely mean a lot. So so thank you for always being so accommodating. Absolutely. Even if my door is closed, it's always open. <laughs> and that's for everybody. I mean, that's just across the board for, you know, the bowling community. You know, if you have questions, I'll try my best to answer you. Um, if I don't get back to you right away, it's not that I'm ignoring you. I'm probably answering Aaron's question of him standing at my door. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I love that about about our about our team in, in the sport is that everybody's you know loves it, and we all love it with a, with a passion. Sometimes um, I don't know if if we can get in trouble if we're too passionate, 
but I think we can because sometimes um, I can be really passionate about something that I love and that's just bowling in the PWBA. Right. Now, now something we know you're passionate about that is not bowling related is, uh, is Star Wars and Baby Yoda. So obviously for the folks who follow you on, on social media, you've been uh, posting a Baby Yoda a day for how many months now? Since uh, the beginning of the year. <laughs> beginning of the year. <laughs> So just just tell us how how did this infatuation with uh, Baby Yoda come so together? I, I do I do love Star Wars. I'm not that into Star Wars as much as it may seem. You know that, um, but I do love Star Wars. Don't get me wrong, people. I've watched them all. I introduced Abigail to. We watched we watched every episode with it. But um, when the Mandalorian started. I, you know, we watched it on Disney Plus and this cute little child came on and it, you know, you're just like, whoa, what's this thing? And then if you haven't seen it, go and watch The Mandalorian, you know, no, Disney didn't pay me for that. See, look, they, I paid for all of this. <laughs> about that? <laughs> but, um, so I just started thinking about in the world, you know, I'm trying to, trying to find ways of finding things that make me happy. You know, there's a lot of things in the world that can make us unhappy. You know, I think we're, we're quicker to be negative than we are to be positive. Um, and everyone who knows me knows I can sometimes be negative Nelly and it's okay because we'll work it out. And, but I wanted to find something that was positive and, and uplifting and, and cute. And clearly that wasn't going to post my photo every day. <laughs> so I found the, you know, the cute little baby, the child, the asset, and I got it, it the other day. But I mean, come on, he's cute. How he's all right. if you don't think he's cute, then you have a problem. But he's I'm a little cute. frightened. You're frightened. <laughs> I mean, so fo on social media, and I only do it on Facebook, but there's always some sort of meme about, you know, what's pisketty, you know, but somebody made up something about chicky nuggets. The child in the Mandalorian says nothing about chicky nuggets. He says nothing about, he doesn't speak, says nothing. He looks cute, but he says nothing. So people have made all this stuff up. So, you know, if you make your own, up your own little mean about chicky nuggies, um, but that's how it all started. Just finding ways to be positive and, and happy. And he makes me happy. I love to see his little face in the morning. And it's, you know, one of the first things I do, I get to my phone and I, find my next little meme to post and it goes up. And usually it's up before 8 a.m. every morning, even on the weekend. So if you need a little pick me up, you know, you can see the child on Facebook or so, that is amazing. on tour. Oh, on tour. yes, I can't wait. There we go. Can't wait for that. Yes, I'm looking forward to that. Yes, very much. It's coming with me right. on the road. Awesome. Two questions, and then we'll get you out of here. Um, we'll save Aaron's question for the last, of course. Uh, we used to, or we generally ask this question, and it involves uh, the collegiate portion of things. But since you didn't bowl collegiately, we'll still ask the question, but in a modified version. So it is basically, what's your favorite ball uh, as a youth player, as a youth bowler, and then your favorite ball as a professional, in essence? Oh, goodness, as a youth player. I mean, I... There's all kinds of bowling balls and I could date back. I mean, I, I'm older now. So, I mean, some of these people who might watch this might not even know what that ball was, but um, it's not that old. But I do remember um, watching a telecast with Del Ballard Jr. And he threw a pink hammer. Mm. And I had to have a pink hammer. Must. I mean, it was, I need that ball. And it wasn't because I saw Dell hook it. Sorry, Dell, love you. <laughs> but it wasn't because it was because it was a pink hammer. It was the coolest looking bowling ball. So, um, you know, my parents were very kind and um, we searched near and far and I got that pink hammer as a young kid. Uh, Teal Rhino Pro, that was another one that I loved. And uh, Turbo X, when those came out, that was fun. Uh, so as a youth player, those were my bowling balls. And then as a professional, 
It was a CUDA 2000. Let's go. It was a CUDA 2000. So if anybody has an original CUDA 2000, I'm not going to drill it because I don't bowl really anymore. <laughs> Sounds like somebody else I know. <laughs> but that was a really that that was that was my money ball. I had one of those, and then I had three of the CUDA C two thousand. So I was I was very fond of that that line of bowling balls. So that was that was a big part of my kind of youth to early adult days. Where do you still have them? I do not have any of them anymore, unfortunately. So they've they have gone away. But uh, but I was very fond of those as well. So all right, Aaron, we're gonna have to find some and bowl on the road. I like it. I'm in. All right, all right. Aaron's all right. got the last question. The and, question. And I, I think we know what one of them already is, and we know what you should watch, Emil. Uh, but what are the <laughs> Tanil Milligan binge watch recommendations? Oh goodness, that are bowl TV appropriate. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, so binge TV during like any time or during this pandemic? Uh, anytime. Anytime. Any All right, anytime. So uh, I suggest that people watch for pure entertainment purposes, you have to watch The Mandalorian. Of course. Because this is your entertainment. <laughs> um, but uh, on a binge watch, we've been watching a lot of Wicked Tuna. Uh, it's If you've never seen Wicked Tuna, it's very interesting in how these people make a living. And it kind of reminds me a little bit about being out on tour. And uh, Some boats help other boats if they're in trouble and they're all trying for, the, you know, the one prize. It, it's... Um, it's an interesting watch and there's some interesting characters. So Wicked Tuna, I have watched the Tiger King. I did. Did you guys watch it? I have not yet. Yeah. It's a beautiful train wreck. <laughs> it is a beautiful, <laughs> it's a beautiful train wreck. And um, again, I see it as, you can relate those people into your lives somehow, whether it's a family member or you're on the road, um, but you've seen these, these folks and you kind of want to figure out, you know, why they're living the way they do. But um, it's a fun, quick watch. And another one that I've watched is um, Don't F with Cats. Mm. I don't know if you've seen that. Mm -mm. That sounds not. serious, though. It, it is serious. It's not for anybody under the age of, I don't know, 14, 15. Um, it's quick. It's three episodes, um, but it will make you um, really focus on what you're searching on the internet. Mm. Don't, F, interesting. Don't, F with, <laughs> don't F with cats. Okay. It's a, yeah. It, I'm sorry. I'm a little disturbed. <laughs> I like it. And it's a little disturbing, but yeah, those are those are fun binge watch shows for me. I, I am curious, since you said it, so did the list slightly change or did you incorporate one or two different shows since the quarantine has happened? Uh well the the Tiger King. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The Tiger King was a, a quarantine watch. Okay. And you know, I don't know if this is something to be proud of, but I watched it twice. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> it's a big time. I, I watched it twice. I did. How about that? Well, there it is. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. Aaron, any final thoughts? Uh, no, not really. I'm I'm just uh, very happy, very grateful that we uh, got to have you on here for a little bit, Tanil. Obviously, we're we're taking you away from your from your daily work at USBC as for our daily work at USBC. So uh, we certainly appreciate that. But uh, great to see you. Great to uh, chat once again, and uh, we'll be looking forward to those text messages later this week. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody out there. We just want to say, be safe. You know enjoy these times with your with your family members um, reach out to the ones that you may not think are having a struggle because um, they may you know it's okay if you're lonely um, 
but there's always somebody out there uh, that will help you in your um, in your group of friends, in your you know acquaintances. As I said earlier in the podcast, you know it might be that one person who's on the road with you that you didn't think would be the one that would be there for you, but you know they are. We are. Um, you know, as a tournament director, I'm here for you. If anybody needs anything, um, you know, but enjoy this time. Don't be, try not to be sad. Um, you know, we're all in this as one, we're all in it together. We will all be back on the lanes at some point in, um, in time. And, uh, you know, I just want to give a little insight PWBA athletes instead of a Sharpie this year, it might be a mask. <laughs> we got to do what we got to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But thanks. I appreciate you guys. You guys stay safe with your families as well. We will. Well said to Neil. We appreciate everyone tuning in. Uh, don't forget this podcast, obviously available on bold TV, but also available wherever you uh, download your podcast from. So we appreciate you checking us out. I uh, we'll want to thank Aaron Smith. Of course, want to thank uh, to Neil Milligan. Uh, this has been episode seven of the PWBA podcast. Next time we will talk with Alicia current. Uh, she is the Delaware state head coach and um, is part of uh, some history uh, since the relaunch of the PWBA tour. So be sure to uh, listen to find out what that history is. Uh, is indeed. So for Aaron Smith to Neil Milligan, my name is Emil Williams Jr. We'll see you next time on the PWBA podcast right here on Bold TV. <laughs>